how, how we got to be here, uh, you know, the Civil War is wound down. The, the, at least the eastern part of the United States has been totally occupied by the Civil War. Now there's rebuilding. And the United States is a growing country. And it just starts on a perpetual boom. Can you all hear me way back there? Yeah. OK, so we're building. We're building structures. We're, and we need, we need material to do that with. And so the logging industry just really picks up after the Civil War. Of course, most of this is done by animals and by hand and by hand tools and so forth. And it starts largely up in Pennsylvania, starts moving down into West Virginia, Western Maryland, to a certain extent in North Carolina, especially Western North Carolina, and all the way down into Alabama. And this is, this is big tree logging in those states. And they would clear out one state, and they would move to the next one, and the next one, and so forth. And a lot of this happened in West Virginia. The reason I picked West Virginia is I went to West Virginia University. I lived there for a while. We still have property up there. I get up there a lot. And I'm skiing, and I'm looking down at the trail. And my buddy goes, well, you know, that was a logging trail. And we, you know, that was a logging trail. Well, you know, that was a logging trail. And finally, I decided to investigate. And if any of you have ever been up to the Snowshoe Ski Resort, that whole thing is built on the old West Virginia pulp and paper um, logging site. It was one of the biggest, if not the biggest, logging site in the eastern United States. And there were many, many other logging companies. So if you look at a map of West Virginia, you can see the surrounding states and the communities. But these were the principal logging companies, the biggest logging companies. And there's still lots of logging companies, including a lot of really small ones. You're going down the road, and you're going to always see logging trucks. And they're going to some kind of mill somewhere. They're doing something with the wood. And some of them are, are well known. Um, West Virginia Pulp and Paper was eventually purchased by Maurer Lumber. And that was the last company that was there. And that's the area where they were logging for the most part. Okay. And so this, this gives you a little bit more of an idea about how West Virginia is built. This is all mountainous right here. That's where a lot of the forests were. And this right here, there's Cass. And I, I suspect a number of you have been to Cass. And we'll talk more about that later. But it's been preserved. And the line went down to Ronsevert. Steve, am I pronouncing that correctly? OK. So just as a quick story, began in the 1880s, they would, they would tie logs together and raft them down the river, down the Greenbrier River. And the West Virginia Pulp and Paper was formed in 1899. Eventually, it becomes a huge logging and paper operation. And Mead West Vaco, Mead Paper, OK, that's what where this, this company became. And it's still out there. And so the line itself eventually got up to about 175 miles of, of logging rail line for West Virginia pulp and paper. And it became the Greensboro Cheat and Elk Railroad. That was the name of it. They sold parts of it off over time, parts to Western Maryland and so forth. And then the company finally folded in 1960. Unlike a lot of legislatures, they went to the legislature and they said, hey, look, we could convert this into a tourist operation. We might be able to make money. And they, the, the West Virginia uh, General Assembly, the House of Delegates, actually went for it. They provided seed money. And in 1960, this became a state park, which it still is today. And you can rent houses up there that were part of the original company houses and stay in them. So th just another, again, another a little bit about the layout. When they were moving logs, that lumber was eventually going to a paper mill for the most part in Covington. And if you drive west on, or east or west, on, on Interstate 64, you see that paper mill down there. In fact, there's a, they would go down the, where the red line is, and then they would take the C and O line over to the, to the paper mill. And there is a picture of the, the paper mill, the Mead West Vaco paper mill, which smells like typical paper mill, that kind of sweet, sickly smell. This shows where the percentages of lumber were coming from across the United States. States that had what the percentages of lumber were state by state for some of the biggest producers. And in 1882, this is where the forests with the most lumber were in West Virginia. And you can see hardwood, white pine, spruce. And we'll come back to that little map in just a little bit. These were big trees. I mean, some of them were as big as redwoods. 
huge trees. Um, the largest tree cut north of Cass, which was right on the Maryland line, had a 13-foot diameter. And curiously enough, all, a lot of this got cut, but there are two particular areas in West Virginia that are preserved areas that missed getting cut. And you can go in there and look. Now, these trees are not 13 feet, but they're seven, eight feet in diameter. And that's interesting. And they're, they're fairly small pieces of property, maybe not more than 50 to 100 acres. Steve, that's Cathedral State Forest and, and places like that. So um, hardwoods like yellow poplar, white spruce, red spruce. Um, the best red spruce was in Dolly Sods, which is a, an area that my father-in-law used to hunt. Everybody hunts up there. It's, it's a desolate, creepy area with fog and all sorts of things. That was all clear cut. So here's white spruce, and there you can see an example of a white spruce compared to this little SUV right here. They're big trees. And this area is cold enough that it's called Little Canada, and that's how come they could grow these trees up there. Um, the most famous buyers of white spruce. Enclosed, please find payment for 500 feet of the fly, finest possible white spruce for use in constructing flying machines. So, I mean, the history is really interesting here. And so this is the sequence. You would select the trees for cutting. You'd notch with an axe. And what they would do, you'll see in a minute, they're doing this. They would also mark on the tree which direction they, the, they wanted the tree to, follow, to fall so that the, that the guys with the saws would come along afterward and they would already have directions as to which direction the tree would fall in. You cut it into shorter lengths after you cut it, usually with a 72-inch saw, belly saw. You skid these trees down the mountain with whatever means you could, a, a water flume. You drag them down with animals, horses, oxen, whatever you had, and then you transport them to the mill. You dump the logs in the mill pond next to the lawn. That's just to, to keep them there. You're, you're, you've got this reserve of logs, and then you haul them out of there, and you haul them into the mill, and you cut them into boards, or you shave them down to um, whatever you need, and shingles, you know, whatever. Um, shavings to make, be made into paper, and then they're sent to the supplier. And so this is, um, this is the county where Snowshoe is, Pocahontas County. And you know, again, you can look at the size of the trees. This picture was taken in 1910. This is in the middle of the state, Nicholas County. This is north of Beckley. Um, I just, I'm just astounded by these old photographs and the size of trees. You don't think about trees like this in the eastern United States. So here they are marking the trees. This, this tree is going to get cut. And unfortunately, they cut down all the big trees. And so I was on a cycling trip once in western Maryland. And we, we stopped on a trail and looked over. This is the, uh, the old, uh, uh, what the heck is that trail called? I can't remember. It's the one that goes from Cumberland down into DC. It was a barge trail. Uh, the CNO, the CNO trail, but it was a barge trail. It wasn't a railroad trail. They were bringing coal barges into DC, and I looked over in the woods, and there was a stump. Now this stump was as high as the ceiling, and it was a good 15 feet wide. It was one of these old trees, and it looked like it had been maybe hit by lightning because it was burned, and that was one of the old growth trees. So, but I've never seen anything else like that. And I've walked through a lot of woods in West Virginia. After they cut down the tree, what did they do with the stumps? Left them there? They were left, yeah. Yeah, they didn't need them. But the bigger the tree, the more you got paid. You got paid by board feet, among other things. So it, if they looked at a big tree like the size of a redwood, it wasn't like, I better preserve this tree. It was, hey, I'm going to cut that thing down because I want the money that I'm going to get paid for cutting that down. So here you, you see they've cut into the tree. This is the biggest tree they, that they know of. This is that tree we were talking about, 13 foot diameter. And look, you've got three people inside the tree. You could fit seven or eight people inside that cut, OK? So you're, you're cutting the tree into smaller lengths. You're removing all of the little branches and whatnot. These are the tools. They're using these 72 inch saws, these six foot saws, belly saws. Here they are. And they, they would have different kinds of teeth on them, depending on what they wanted to cut. This is the best job, the sawyer, the guy that took care of the saws. He got paid more than anybody else. That's a saw shop. Um, you, you know, all the different kinds of things. I've got a catalog that shows all the different tools. You know, some of you may have had relatives that were in logging, and you, you recognize a lot of this. Tongs to pick up logs with, chains to help move the logs with, and so forth. 
Okay, a PV. Okay, or called a. Anybody know the other name for it? Usually, a cant hook. A cant hook. It allows you to turn logs over. Okay, and this is interesting because this is a North Carolina company that made logging tools. Here's out of their catalog, Surrey Parker, in Pine Town. They would have these logging villages. Of course, they'd all be temporary. They go in, they clean out all the trees, then they'd move everything to a new location. And you see some of these camps here. Um, a lot of immigrants came to this country, and they worked these four industries. And they, <clears throat> the immigrants, my, my grandparents came, and they did this. They worked in the mines. And they were such great workers that they would go over to the, the village where the people came from or in the old country, and they would bring back more of them. And so that's, you'd end up with these little villages full of people that are all from the same village back in the old country. And they were hard workers. That was a tough, tough life. You can imagine trying to harvest lumber and, and the accidents that happen. You know, branch snaps back, whacks you in the head, and you fall 30 or 40 feet to the ground. You know, and there's, what kind of medical care is there out in the middle of nowhere? So here's uh, camp cars. This is actually railroad camp cars. OK, so if you've ever been to Cass, you may have ridden the train that goes all the way to the top of the mountain, OK? You can go halfway up and then come down, or you can go all the way to the top of the mountain when you ride the train. You can't go here. This takes a split, and it goes off to a different part of a higher part of the mountain. And there was a second town up there. They had their own mill. They had their own railroad system. They had their own roundhouse. Everything was up there. It's just foundations now, and I'll show you pictures of that. But look at all the buildings. These people lived up there in the middle of nowhere. And eventually, they would cut all that wood up and send it down to the mill at the bottom of the hill and out on the, on the Chesapeake in Ohio. These are Western Maryland. Um, these are, are um, heavy consolidations. They're, they're um, 280s. And they would, I, I've seen pictures where on a train, one of them, because of the, the steepness and the curves, they would have 10 log cars assigned to every one engine. And they might have five engines on the train just to get 50 cars down the mountain. Amazing. More views of spruce. That was a big mill on the top of the mountain. Look at the snow, 1926. This is 27 feet. The snow is unbelievable up there. This is what spruce looks like today. It's just foundations, some walls, things like that. We sometimes ride our bikes up there. It's a We'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. So this, this became part of the Western Maryland. And the Western Maryland would go all the way down into central West Virginia to a place called Webster Springs. And they would also get coal and bring coal trains back up there. So the loggers, the logging companies, would frequently mine coal. They would, um, they would eat like way more calories than any of us would ever eat because they were expending so many calories. And they celebrated, too. Tucker County's in, it's near the Maryland line. These guys are having just too much fun. OK, you only ever had Sunday off. So if they're, if they're playing in the, in the company band, it's got to be a Sunday. Because all the other days of the week, they are working, working, working until from early morning to late at night. So this shows how they used to move the logs. They would move them down this sluice. And the trouble is, it would turn really muddy, and then it would freeze. And so that made a mess out of things. Then they would build these flumes, these on, on trestles. They were um, railways, essentially. And you can guess that this was not easy to control. Look at this one. You, get, you meet a log coming down the mountain at about 100 miles an hour. OK, and then this is more true in colder climates like the upper Midwest, Minnesota, places like that, Michigan. You know, they would, they would draw these sleds filled with logs. And then they would use aerial tramways. And they would move like one log at a time down the mountain, which, as you can imagine, is tedious. Um, this is a skipper road. It's a log road. OK. Some of these pictures are better than others. Oxen. OK. It's a Perry log cart. Hauls one log at a time. But they're all big logs. That's. That's a big log. That's a big wheel. OK. Then they started using these. These were, again, towed by animals. <laughs> again, big logs. And they would, this is a picture load contest. So they weren't, take, they weren't going anywhere with these logs. 
They just wanted to see how many logs they could load up, and they would take a picture of it. It was a contest. You can imagine that this might go wrong sometimes, and what might happen. Uh, rafting down the river, uh, if, you, if you've seen the Greenbrier River, it's very shallow. But in the springtime, when it's higher, it's easier to get the logs down. So they would have these big laft, uh, rafting workforces where all the men would get together and they would move all the logs at once and go 75 miles down the river to where they'd meet the CNO. So that's what you're seeing here. So then they started trying rails, and that's what you're seeing here. Some of the first rails were wooden rails. And that was an OK idea, but wood on wood the friction coefficient is, is pretty high, so it would just tear up the rails and the, and the wheels. They used metal wheels. That worked better. Some of the um, early ones, the flanges were on the outside and the inside, so they could stay on that wooden rail. Then they started using metal rails. How do you like this? 78% grade. Now, there's a cable helping that, so it's not just flying down the mountain by itself. but. <coughs> Logging country train was so steep that even chipmunks had a double head to get up the hill. Yeah. It twisted in and out and left the travelers still in doubt whether the snake that made the track was going out or coming back. So on average, they wanted to try and stay under about 7%. The, the mountain track, if you've ever ridden the train all the way to the very top of Cass, that's 11.5%. Okay? Um, I, I've ridden that on a mountain bike, and it is a killer to go up that mountain. I, we got to the top one time, and the people got off the train, and they looked at us, and they went, where did you come from? We said, we rode up the mountain. They said, you mean up that mountain? So this is one of the first steam locomotives. They had The first ones came out with vertical boilers, OK, the boilers sticking straight up rather than horizontal boilers. And they started experimenting. They tried mainline engines like this Atlantic, but they, they were, the, the frame was just too long. They would, they would derail frequently, even the short ones. OK? They tried all kinds of things. It's a motor car pulling a train, an electric locomotive. This is out west. This is in Oregon. And then the logging engines came, the real logging engines. And uh, the chairman of the history department in, at West Virginia University wrote that more than anything else, the logging engines deforested West Virginia faster than anything. So this is one of the logging types. This is a Heisler. So this is how they, they're named. This is a two truck. There's one truck. There's a second truck. Three trucks, one, two, three, four trucks. Although I cheated when I made this picture, Heisler never had four trucks. They only had three twos, and, and uh, that's it. So they were either coal-fired or wood-fired. Then you had water back here. And all of these trucks are powered. That's what made them, their adhesion was so good going up and down mountains, because all those trucks were powered, and they're all articulated. So they could go around these sharp corners. Their cylinders are vertical, so these are going up and down rather than in some other direction. And this is the most famous one, the Shea locomotive, named after Ephraim Shea, the designer, the inventor. And he he couldn't he had a logging operation and he just couldn't he couldn't get the logs out and he decided he was going to make something that was going to work better. And the rod engines, the conventional steam engines, would the vibration would knock the engine all over the place and derail it. So he designed this Shea. Um, he was a civil engineer, logger, railway owner, inventor. Um, they linked to gears only on one side of the locomotive, his engine. The other ones did other things. Okay, Vertical cylinders. Um, the gears are beveled. You, if you've never seen them before, you'll see them in a second, which increased traction. And he contracted with, uh, with Lima Locomotive Works in Northeast Ohio. The, the Lima locomotive works that made all the other steam engines. And they delivered them for other countries. This is one of his early patent drawings with a, this is a horizontal boiler, OK? And you can see it's a really simple arrangement, a two-truck shea. There's the gearing. OK, this is the overhead view right here. So this is the, the right-hand side. OK, this is the left-hand side. 
you can see this is the arrangement of the wheels. These are the port wheels. These are the starboard wheels. This is that geared arrangement. So they're all geared out to the side. Okay? And it's, it can re-rail itself. You just back it up and it's back on the track again. Because you can't knock all the trucks off at once. So this shows how the shafts fit together. Okay, and you'll see a, another picture that shows you a little bit better here in a minute. That's, that's his first successful design right there. Vertical boiler, two truck shea. Okay, there's the line shaft that connects them. You can see the gearing. These are these beveled gears here that are going to meet these beveled gears here. And that's, that's one of the cast shays right there. They put covers over the top of these gears so that branches and all kinds of other crap wouldn't fall in there and, and foul the gears and cause other problems. You can see how they track. Hey, there's all the articulated gears here. That's the starboard side. Here's the port side over here. I know they don't use those terms on the railroad, but you know what I'm talking about. This is Lima Locomotive Works. Um, they built Shays exclusively up until 1945. Um, I was there right at the time they were tearing this down in 1998. And it was still interesting to see all the, the stuff laying around, the artifacts. So this is one of his early advertisements. Um, that's a big Shea. Look at the size of this man compared to the engine. Okay. Some of the ads. Okay, three truck Shea. One, two, three. How big is that? That's... That's got to be a that's got to be a 75 to 100 ton engine. Okay, just some other ads. A, a two truck Shea. Okay, and this just shows the components. So you're again looking from the right side, air tank. You can see the art the articulated line shafts right here. How the bevel gears fit together. There's the protective sleeve over the gears. Okay, some of the other components. It's, you know, pretty much so similar to a, an ordinary steam engine in regard to these things here, but... Okay. And it, they claim 12% grades. Um, they could do more than that, really. It's a really tiny little shea. Look at the size of this. It's got, a obviously, a little cabin built over it, kind of crudely built, but... It did what they wanted it to do. And a lot of these operations, remember, were really small. Some of these were not a lot more than mom and pop operations. So this is some of the early shades right here, West Virginia Pulp and Paper. Um, Greenbrier Cheat and Elk, that was another name, that was a later name for the West Virginia Pulp and Paper, Paper Railroad. And so look at this, 150 ton, three truck shade. This thing is a monster. And then there was this. It's the longest, biggest Shea ever built. Not the heaviest, but the biggest. And CNO and N and W and Southern bought several of these, and they ended up with uh, West Virginia Pulp and Paper and the Western Maryland. This is a four truck Shea. It's huge, 203 tons. Unfortunately, they scrapped all of them. But Broadway Limited just came. Well, they just announced. The four truck Shea is coming out in the fall, in the fall of next year, for 600 bucks or something like that. I think you can find them for 400 though. So how does a big Shea like that, 203 tons, with 75,000 pounds of tractive force, compare to a 1940s Jeep 7? Well, there are the figures. Okay, the Shea had a lot more tractive force, but it was a lot bigger, harder to maintain. Diesel, you just get in it, start it up, and take off. So. And if you needed more of them, you just hooked up more of them. So these are the, the four typical Shea locomotives. Type A had two trucks, two cylinders. Type B, two trucks, three cylinders, and so forth and so on, all, all the way up to the Type D, the four truck ones. Some Class I railroads owned Shea's for specific purposes. This is a Canadian Pacific one. New York Central had some. So they could move, maneuver around some of these back alleys in some of the warehouse districts, but they were required to have this shroud over it by the city of New York. This is one of the CNO four truck shays. 
it's just it's huge okay and the speed on these things you know you're talking about five ten maybe 20 miles an hour this is um, a, a standard three truck Shea compared to one of those big four truck Shea so you get an idea of what the relative size is okay that's a four truck owned by Western Maryland okay and then Southern Railway used these in Tennessee for steep mountain grades uh, they were never a great solution but they had them so they had they had two of these and eventually they ended up with a CNO and they were eventually scrapped so that, that the Southern Railway this is N&W they had one it ended up somewhere out in Oregon or California eventually yeah oh, here it is Red River Lumber in Northern California I haven't done this program in about 10 years so I'm a little rusty on it so this is the heaviest Shea ever built 162 tons um, this is preserved at Cass okay it's magnificent and it frequently runs that's the the non mechanism side so you see it looks pretty plain on the other side Th those cylinders aren't here and if you haven't noticed it in these pictures the whole boiler is offset to the left because you've got all this mechanism over here on the right and it, that weighs so much over here so they move the boiler over here to balance it so the locomotive wouldn't fall over okay there are, there are Pacific Coast Shays uh, there used to be one up at Cass it's a it's a souped up Shay basically and then this was the heaviest one ever built owned by Kansas City Southern to work the warehouse districts down near the Missouri River in Kansas City that had um, switchbacks and so they they had two of them this was the bigger of the two and it looks monstrous some other railroads that were class ones that had them B&O had one Rio Grande had five UP had three Northern Pacific had one they were just they were bought for specific purposes um, lumbering in, a, in in Hawaii in Taiwan I mean they just turned up everywhere and 1910 1920 a new hundred ton three truck Shea cost $20,000 sounds cheap but of course $20,000 was a whole lot of money back then so this is a, a one work down on the docks in Wilmington it was a little two truck Shea could fit in and out of all kinds of little slots in between warehouses and all this is in Detroit switching at a car plant at the Hoover Dam these I, I should have stuck a video in here for those of you who have never seen one of these in operation to see those cylinders going up and down and see those shafts turning because it's just unbelievable to see all the parts moving at the same time okay this is a left-handed version this was back in the 50s you're inside the Shea this is the Elk River coal and lumber just neat old pictures there were uh, nearly 3,000 Shays built um, the oldest and the second oldest and the newest one still operate at Cass so this one is the oldest it's in California it's static it doesn't work okay then the Heisler came along it's a different design it's got a central shaft and they can be recognized by this v-shaped thing that is right here in the center so the cylinders go like this okay they're right in the center and they're hooked to a central shaft right here that runs the length of the locomotive directly under the boiler okay they were built in upstate New York um, not nowhere near the the number produced as in the Shays there are still 35 of them out there and here you can see and you can actually see this is an anim this is an animation you can see that v-shaped shaped, um, cylinder arrangement running there there it is from the front okay there are the pistons okay there's another Heisler again there's the piston they're huge look at this that's the left hand one the right hand one it's on the other side they also had articulated trucks so see this shaft right here it meant that that truck could do this kind of stuff which meant up in the woods that was really handy because it was hard to derail those engines um, this is a three truck Metal River Shea and guess what it's completely restored and it's up at Cass 
they have, I have, I have a list of how many engines they have restored, and I'll come to that in a minute. So Meadow River, um, <laughs> yeah, they produced all the lumber for, for this shack. And uh, so if you go through Central West Virginia, you'll see a lot of these uh, flooring companies that are still there that were descendants of the old companies. Um, Armstrong, Bruce, all that stuff is still there. Then diesel started coming along. Heisler made a diesel. Um, then the last big company is the is the Climax, and it's got it's got cylinders that work like this instead. Okay, so the Shays had usually usually three, but sometimes two cylinders that went up and down on one side. The Heislers had that V-shaped arrangement where the cylinders worked like this. This one had two cylinders that worked on the sides, and we'll talk about which one which ones work the best, but this is one of the early patent drawings. Okay, vertical boiler. Okay, and here you can see how this worked. There's a little animation. Okay, cute little engines. They, and this was actually mechanically considered superior to the Shea. Okay, they only built about a thousand of them. There's a f still a few out there. This is a great picture. I love this picture. Look at this thing here. So that's a spark arrester. They had a terrible problem. One year in West Virginia, they had more fires started by steam engines and loggers than they did in any other way. They actually had more wood burned than they actually harvested in one year. It was sometime before 1910. I can't remember. I think it's in one of these slides. So you can see there's that piston valve. Well, wait a minute, let's back up. It shows the two different kinds of valves. What, this is a piston valve, that's a slide valve. That, that slides within that sleeve. More, more information than you really want to know. That's what the, the Climax geared truck looked like. Here's a Climax working down in central West Virginia. Pulling some big logs. That's, in, that's not in West Virginia, that's obviously Washington State. Just amazing looking things. So there are some climaxes that are restored. There are two of them in this area. And so if you're, you're looking for something to do railroad-wise, there are six different railroad operations in that general area that you can ride that, that restored, that destroyed big articulated, that, that CNO 1309, the Durban and Greenbrier Valley. You can ride the, any of the cast trains. Um, there is the, um, oh, I can't think of the others, but there, there are six different railroads you can ride up there. You could spend two weeks up there, no problem. Okay. Um, Shays were slower than, Heimax, than Heisler's and Climax's. Uh, Heisler's and Climax's rode smoother than Shays because they were more balanced. They didn't rock back and forth. Um, Heisler's and Climax's could could uh, clear higher water than Shays. And Shays would just, all those engines would just run right across creeks and things like this. Um, Heiser was considered the poorest built. Climax considered the least efficient in terms of power generation. Um, we talked about the flanges. The, those rod locomotives, like I said, they beat up the tracks. And these other engines, these geared engines, that's what all these are. Heislers and Climaxes and Shays, they're geared engines. They didn't beat up the tracks as much. Shays were more trouble-free than Heislers or Climaxes. So this talks about fuel economy and so forth, how much it costs to operate them. Again, probably more than you want to know. So Heisler closes in 45. The last Shay was made in 45. Climax folded a long time before that. This is looking down from the top of the mountain. Um, the log trains that are going, this, this train is going down the mountain. And uh, we'll, we'll talk more about how they got down the mountain in a minute. You can hear those, I mean, when we're over at the ski resort, we can hear that the engines sometimes going up the mountain, not coming down, but you can hear them going up that bang, 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 bang. So the patent ran out on the chaise, and so a Western company, I think in Portland, if I remember, Portland, Oregon, they made a copy of the Shea. It looks just like it. And it was called the Willamette, named after the Willamette River in, uh, in Oregon. And there are only six of them left, but they only ever made 33 of them. That was actually pretty successful. 
Baldwin tried to make some geared locomotives, but they only made a few of them. This shows an engine crossing the, the river. They would, uh, there are tracks there. They're just down in the creek. OK? Lots and lots of these were narrow gauge, too, th three foot gauge. Okay, these are, this is the fuel that was used, but if you were burning wood, just like it says here, it would just burn up the wood. Just, you'd have to have cords and cords of wood. <coughs> Five cords for 100 miles of travel. So this is the crew. These are all the people you need to operate a logging train. An engineer, a fireman, somebody who cut the tree, somebody that sets the hooks on the tree, somebody who directs the log placement, a brakeman or more brakemen, and a loader operator. So that's a lot of people for one train. This is a pretty good size logging operation. Okay, so they started out with about, they finished up with about 81 miles of track. Um, they were one of the largest log logging operations in the U.S. Um, let's see what else is worth mentioning here. 12 steam engines at its peak. So that's a few. Um, train accidents were common. People were getting killed right and left. Trains would run off the track. They would they'd go down the mountain and, and they would they would see what was going to happen and the whole crew would just jump and let the train go. In fact, there's an interesting story about the, the train's out of control. It's going down the mountain. They all jump off the train and they walk down the mountain to pick up the pieces and the train gradually had stopped and started steaming back up the mountain. It had thrown itself into reverse somehow and they met the train coming up the mountain. <laughs> 3,000 logger, loggers killed by the 1940s. It was called joining the birds or visiting the mill. That, that's when you crashed your train. How do you recognize a logging brakeman? By his missing fingers. When I, when I worked that job as a track gang, so the, the foreman says, there was always an illustration as to what not to do. So, when you flip that rail off that track, now don't be standing in the way of that pry bar. And the, and the foreman turns his head like this, and he's got a scar all the way up here. The first day on the job, I got hit by the pry bar. Th throwing railroad ties, picking up railroad ties and throwing them. Now, if, those, if that tie's coming toward you, don't you get your fingers in between those ties, and the other crew member holds up his hand, and it's like this. There was always an illustration. Um, yeah, we're not going to get into this, but they, Shays had a problem where they would spread the rails and cause a derailment, and that was, that was always a problem. How did they reduce runaways? Now, you got a train here with about 15 logging cars, logging buggies. Yeah, I would say somewhere. It, when you came down the mountain, you never went down nose first. You always backed the train down. That way you could use the braking power. So... That's why you see them coming down the mountain backwards. Um, it shows them building um, rails, but they would, they would use logs for ties frequently, and they would, you know, they would put the track in just as long as they needed it, and then they'd rip it back out again. This shows a little bit more complicated operation, uh, putting in uh, ties and rails. This is out west, but I had to throw this in here. There, there are some phenomenal temporary trestles that were built, and this is amazing. This is 204 feet high. Then they started getting um, tractors in the woods. Some, sometimes they were built like steam engines. If you've ever seen a Lombard tractor, it was basically a steam engine on wheels, and it, it operated like a train. This is a Lombard tractor. There's one preserved at a museum up in Maine. And I think there's one in Michigan or Wisconsin somewhere. And I've got a file with all kinds of pictures of all kinds of crazy looking jitneys that are pulling logs. It just, it's amazing all the different things that they tried. And then the cars themselves, these are called disconnects, they're little cars. Um, they're all kinds. This is a catalog with logging buggies. And Cass has a bunch of these up there. They're basically just disconnected trucks that you'd load logs on. They used uh, buggies like this up at Cass. In fact, those are the frames for the tourist cars that are up there. <coughs> the Hoo Hoo logging car. Mm -hmm. 
and they also use flat cards. This is a picture taken up there behind the shops at Cass. And then loading, there are all kinds of ways to loading. You'd, uh, you'd make a cross haul like you see here and try and load logs. A hay rack boom, it looked like a ladder. You pick it up and lower logs one at a time. And then they started coming up with, this is uh, Lidgerwood. It's a giant derrick. And they have one preserved up at Cass. It was this pylon that had cables that went in all directions. And it would pull all the logs toward a central place where then they could just load them all at once. And it really sped up the gathering of logs. Then they started getting these little lo log loaders. This is one of the more popular ones. You can get, there's a, IHC has had a model of this for years. Barnhart loader. And I'm going to blow this picture up because it looks really neat when you look right in here. Suddenly you can see all the men. Here, you really can't see that that well, but I mean, this was definitely labor intensive. Okay, this is a great picture too. It's an overhead view of this, this loader would just go car by car on these tracks, load the first car back up, load the second car back up, and so forth until it was done. So this is a tower skitter. This is a, an amplification of what I just showed you, okay? And again, there are all these cables. They drag all of the, the logs in. And this is the one that's preserved up at Cass. This shows the interior of it. There's another view. It, would, it could work a, a zone that was a pretty good sized zone like this. I love this picture too, because you've got a loader, you've got a Che, and you've got an old Chevy. It's just, it's just really so... Um, evocative. Wood hick transport meant that they hooked up an engine to any kind of a car and the workers were hauled up the mountain or back down the mountain again, but sometimes they had uh, self-propelled cars. This is a McKean motor car that was converted into a wood hick car and these critters that were rail buses and many of you recognize this. This was up at Cass, I'm sorry, it was at Buffalo Creek and Golly and this is probably where you've seen it, if you've seen it. It's at Strasburg. It's been at Strasburg for years. But that was a Wood Hick rail bus. Okay. And they even had ambulances, rail ambulances to go back up in the woods. So remember that map that I showed you about the coverage of the forests? Okay, that's this area here. This shows all the, the, the railroads in that area to get the lumber out of there. Let's back up. That's the, the, the West Virginia Pulp and Paper Railroad. The Greenbrier Cheat and Elk. This shows all the mainline railroads in the area. And now we go to the mill. So all the logs get to the mill and then what? Okay, so you're going to maybe chip it, make it into, into wood chips and make paper out of it, or you're going to make it into things that you're going to use for houses and schools and whatnot. So, these boards. Look at the size of that board. I mean, you'd never see stuff like that today because that's a big tree. So this is a typical view of the mill. Okay, so there was a big mill down <coughs> at Cass <coughs> that burned down in 1922 and then they built another one and it burned down in 1984. But this shows what the mill's like and I'll show you another picture that's better. This is down near Raynell. And so it, it splits out everything that's going out of the mill. So you get all these different things. This is the log pond, <clears throat> the conveyor that goes into the sawmill and cuts everything up. This sorts all the wood over here, dries the wood over here. This is storage over here. So it's a big operation. <clears throat> Another view. This was the mill up at Spruce on top of the mountain. <clears throat> I don't know exactly what happened to it. I don't know whether it burned down or just fell down or what, but it's... There's only a foundation there. This is the, the skidway. And remember, they bring the logs up, they dump them in the pond, and hold them there until they're ready for them. Okay? There's the pond. Then when you get into the mill, it's just a huge, noisy operation. How do you like that? Think you can make a decent-sized coffee table out of that? They're making shingles. Okay? 
And that was the, the world's largest double band saw. So it's got these saw blades that are constantly rotating, cutting the wood up, and it sped everything up tremendously. Okay? Here's the, the lumber storage. And this is what happens. Unfortunately, they burn down. And this is what it looks like today after the 84 fire. And then, they, like I said, they also had a coal operation that supported the logging operation, but they also made money from it. There's a funny story about coal up at the Snowshoe Ski Resort. When you're at the top of the resort and you look down, you can look at the next mountain, and there's a big dugout area on the mountain. Well, the ski resort found a coal seam up there only they're prohibited from mining it by the way that the state laws are, are structured. Um, and the only thing that they could do was they, they announced that they were going to build an air, airport on the top of that mountain. But to build the airport, they had to remove all the coal first. And that's how they got around it. So if, you, if you're up there, you see this big gouge in the mountain. That's where they took all the coal out. Did the airport ever get built? Or did they just Hell no. They weren't going to build. They weren't going to build a. <laughs> wink, wink, wink. That's how that got done. Okay, so you know, the the amount of lumber being produced in the United States was immense, more than coal. So again, the map. This is where all the forests were. That what that's what was left by 1913. They had just cleaned it out. This is that quote I had referred to earlier. And also, it just it caused erosion, forest fires, cut down big trees. Okay. This is a forest fire. This area is still barren today because the fire was so intensive and so hot that it burned right down into the soil and the soil is um, not able to support any growth. That is, oh, that's not far from Dolly Sods. Okay, in 1907, this is what I was referring to earlier. They burned, they burned more timber than they cut in 1907. 15 minutes. Pardon me? 15 minutes. Yeah, I, I, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. These are different spark arresters on the top of locomotives, different designs to try and stop forest fires. Look at this. Biggest spark arrestor contest. They didn't have these in West Virginia, but they had them in out west, a fire train. They would have um, an engine and cars, water tank car, firefighting equipment just sitting waiting because the fires were so frequent. Again, diesels show up, little diesels, and you start seeing more of those. This is an electric engine, OK? And eventually, the logging industry just declined and declined and declined. And um, this shows a graph showing you know, the, the peak years is 1909. And then after that, it just went downhill. And this is why. This was what killed off all the logging, wall to wall carpet. People didn't want wood floors anymore. So that was the end of logging. So again, they saved CAS. They paid, they granted $125,000, and they just got volunteers to start working on this. And these volunteers just worked and worked and worked to make this thing a success. And these are some of the photos from CAS that are, I, uh, I like these. I didn't take any of them. You can do this next summer if you want to, all these pictures you're looking at it's you know it's not stuff you could do in the past but you can do it now yeah look at look at the track you know that's good that's great when you've got a, a a long lens they will they will frequently double and triple head engines just like you see here that is western maryland number six the big one and this is this is what they have right now so they have seven operating steam engines five shays uh a Heisler and a Climax. And it's just unbelievable. People come from all over the world there. I'm standing there watching the train, and some guy next to me is talking to his buddy in German. 
or in some other language. Japanese people there, they have buses that come in from everywhere and bring people from Cleveland and Pittsburgh and Washington and Philadelphia. It's, it's a Mecca. This is the village. Um, many, not all of these buildings are restored. This is where people lived. Not the average wood hick. The wood hicks lived up in the mountains, usually. Um, Cass is named for the West Virginia Pulp and Paper Vice President George Cass, uh, Joseph Cass. Across the river is where Wild Wild West used to be. But this just shows a map, and it shows you all the different things. The train ride goes here. So you, you park in the parking lot down here, and you go up that way. And this is, these are the shops over here. That's the restored village. If you want to stay there, you go to the West Virginia State Parks website, and that's how you can reserve places to stay. This is the old hotel. That's the huge, it used to be the biggest building in West Virginia at one time, the company store. It's still open. It's a restaurant now. It's a gift shop. That's the depot, which burned down, unfortunately, and they rebuilt it. Um, the water tank. There is the, the, the old mill, which, again, I said is burned down. There's a deadline here. This is looking down the street. This is the church in Cass. This school is no longer there. Um, when I took this picture, it was, a, it was falling in, and it, most of it fell in after that, and they just took it away. That's the village. That's what it looked like in 1917. That's the store back in the old days. That's what it looks like today. It's a huge building. That's the engine shops. The, <laughs> the engine shop burned down, too. And they rebuilt it. That's the new engine shop. And nearby, that's the Snowshoe Ski Resort. It extends from here all the way over to there. And the Green Bank Observatory is near there. That's where they do, they have uh, radio telescopes. They do research there. That's the place where you can't get a cell phone signal because it interferes with the equipment. This is the Potomac Eagle. That's the railroad I couldn't remember. This is the Salamander, which comes out of Elkins. It's just, the scenery is just phenomenal everywhere there. It's just there's a lot of things to do, a lot of places to go. A little bit about North Carolina logging. I don't have much on it, but you're looking at some pictures in Beaufort County. Little tiny shays. There's a lot of logging in western North Carolina. This is one of the most famous ones, Graham County Railroad. And if you, if you know anything about this, you know that later on that they converted it into a tourist operation. And the two shays that were there, Shea 1926 and 1925, um, one is at the North Carolina Transportation Museum. is not currently running because it needs a new boiler. And the other one was disintegrating, and so they sold it for parts up to Cass. So it, it's used for parts. Here is 1925. Nice-looking three-truck Shea, 70 ton. It's down, housed in one of the stalls. And there's still out there. There's still out there. Um, just about done here. Just uh, some of these are pretty funny. Um, an ape wagon is a caboose. Um, scenery inspector, the engineer, master maniac. I'm gonna bake a cake. I'm gonna get up ahead of steam. Grade destroyer, a log car with a bulkhead at one end, so it just knocks everything out. Go homesteading. Hit the brush. Join the birds means to jump from a moving train. And there they are, Shea in the middle, a uh, Eisler on either side of a climax. So that's the fastest I've ever gone through there. But I did eliminate a lot of slides. So I um, hope it was interesting. Um, it's, you know, that's an advertisement for going up there to visit. I mean, there's just so much neat stuff to see up there. Even if you're not into trains, the scenery is phenomenal. Um, it's a beautiful part of the United States. So. Hope you get a chance to do it if you've never been up there. Any questions about any of that? Yeah, we got, we got.